well, uh, happy Easter Sunday, uh, brothers and sisters, and it is a, a real pl- pleasure to be uh, here this morning and opening up this text from Romans 8. Uh, please, if you have a Bible, uh, leave it open in front of you. Uh, th- this is the passage we'll be looking at this morning. Well, it's been almost 2,000 years uh, Christians have been celebrating this news. In fact, uh, nine years uh, from this Easter, we will be, Lord willing, celebrating the 2000th, 2000th, that's a hard word to say, uh, anniversary of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, And it's been 2,000 years that Christians have been celebrating and claiming that this is the center of history. This claim that emerged from the earliest days of the Christian movement, that Jesus died under the Romans, under Pontius Pilate, that his tomb was found empty that Sunday morning, and that he appeared first to a small group of women who had gone to the tomb that early morning, and then to various other disciples in subsequent weeks, including at one time, appeared to over 500 people. Now, it's true that some people have tried to interpret this claim as some sort of a metaphor, that the disciples weren't really saying that Jesus' physical body was involved, that he physically rose, but rather that the resurrection is a symbol of hope. Uh, The disciples were wanting to keep Jesus alive in their hearts. But no matter how many times you read the earliest Christian writings, it's very, very clear the disciples are talking about bodies. In fact, many people don't realize that ancient historians and more so perhaps today than a generation ago, uh, historians really do take the resurrection seriously as an historical claim, even if they they don't go so far to believe uh, that it really happened. There's no avoiding that this claim has to be taken seriously. In fact, Giza Vermes, uh, the Oxford Oxford, uh, professor of Jewish studies, uh, who is definitely not a Christian, but an ancient historian, uh, wrote a book, The Resurrection, And his conclusion, after 250 pages, was straightforward. It looks like there really was an empty tomb, and it's certain that people really thought they saw the risen Jesus. See, this is the heart of this claim. The resurrection is about bodies. And what what is sometimes neglected, though, is the connection between this event and what it means for our bodies. See, the Christian faith is positive about the body. The Christian faith has a positive view of the physical world, a positive view of the body. See, salvation in the Bible is not simply about souls. It's not simply about that immaterial part of us and floating off to heaven. No, salvation is about God restoring what was lost in the fall, and that is what the resurrection is all about. And our text today in Romans 8, we see this very clearly, the connection between the events of Easter and your body, my body. Do our bodies matter? Does it matter what I do with my body? Easter says a resounding yes to that question. In our text today, we'll, we'll see two things. Firstly, we'll see that the good news of Easter brings new spiritual life. It brings a new start, a new spiritual life in the believer now. But the second thing is that the gospel secures a glorious finish. It brings a new start, but it also secures a glorious finish, new life to our mortal bodies. And so please uh, look with me in Romans 8 verses 9 to 11. Firstly, the gospel brings a new start. This part we might be more familiar uh, with, verses 9 and 8, because Paul in Romans 8 summarizes his message from chapter 1 to 7, that Jesus brings a new start for those who come and trust in Him and find life in Him. It's a new start that is freed from condemnation, the condemnation of the law that he outlines in chapter 7. The cycle of sin and guilt and condemnation, where, where our slavery to sin and our awareness of God's law means that we are 
caught up in the cycle of condemnation and rejection of God and His authority over us. Christ, Paul says, has set us free. He set us free, firstly, by being offered up as a sin offering, bearing our guilt, and to those who trust in Him, bringing justification and life and freedom from the verdict of the law on our lives. And so Christians, Paul says, live for a new master. They have a new direction. They live for righteousness. They have a new principle of life in them through the Spirit. And Paul summarizes this in verses 9 and 10 by saying this, uh, Romans 8 verse 9, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. You are not in the flesh, Paul says. Now, what does he mean by that? He doesn't mean uh, you, you are not in a body. Obviously, he can't mean that. What does he mean by telling Christians, you are not in the flesh? Uh, <clears throat> now, in, in Paul's thinking, you shouldn't want to escape the body. Bodies are created by God. Bodies are good. And even here, this word isn't a negative thing. For that, he uses the term flesh. Flesh is a different word than body. And it's the word that Paul uses for human beings under the control of sin. Humans out of control, away from the life of God, away from God's grace. And so when Paul says, you're not in the flesh, he isn't saying you're not living in a body, he's saying you're not part of that world anymore that's turned against God. You're not part of that, that age, that, that realm, because you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of life. You're now indwelt by God's Spirit. You've been made alive. God has claimed you. You are not in the flesh. And so now for the Christian, he says, outwardly the, the body may look dead because of sin, but inwardly there's a different principle at work, a new principle of life through the Spirit. You've been declared righteous. You now live for righteousness. You belong to righteousness. You belong to God. Uh, think, think of an old uh, run-down house. Imagine for a moment a large stately house that has been neglected for years and years. Maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a gang house. There's holes in the walls, the ceilings are, are yellowed from cigarette smoke. There are burnt out cars in the front yard with overgrown grass growing up through the chassis of the, the, the cars. And everyone in the, in the neighborhood knows what this house represents. Oh yeah, that one, the gang house. But then, new tenants move in. And immediately, the house is filled with life again. There's hospi hospitality being practiced. There's, there's joy, there's, there's laughter, there's thanksgiving. Now, the house itself doesn't look all that different at that point. But in another sense, it's completely changed. It's new. It's being used for something completely different. And so it is for the, for the Christian. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. This is what Paul means. For the Christian, your, your past doesn't matter. You are, you've been justified by faith. The spirit lives in you. And what is most true of you, well, it, it, it isn't actually what your body was used for in the past or what people may think of you. You have a new name. And your body, well, that is where Jesus lives now. And some of you, I, I think, particularly will need to hear that this Easter. That you are not in the flesh if the Spirit of God lives in you. You are a new creation. Outwardly, it may not feel like much has changed, maybe. 
maybe you're sitting here today and you, uh, <coughs> when you think of how other people see you, that's the old you. But everything has changed if the Spirit of God lives in you. Because God has claimed you. He has declared you right in His sight. You've got a new thirst for righteousness now. And it's not because you've all of a sudden decided to reform your ways, but because of the one who has come to dwell in you. See, the gospel brings about a new start. The body may be dead because of sin. That outward you. But there is someone new living within you. Now, does Paul stop there? Does he at that point then move on to exhortation? Well, he does in verse 12, but that would be to skip over verse 11. And it would be to miss a crucial part of God's saving work in the believer through the Spirit. Because yes, the gospel means a new start. Yes, it means a new resident has taken up possession of your life and of your body. But to stop there would, would to miss the Easter hope. It would be to miss the resurrection. And it would be to miss that the gospel secures a glorious conclusion to the plan of salvation. See, the story doesn't stop with the, the building having a new owner, but it finishes with the redemption of our bodies. Verse 11, have a look. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Notice at the start there just uh, how gloriously Trinitarian Paul's thinking is. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, H whose Spirit? The Spirit of the Father. The Father who sent His Spirit to raise His Son, the Lord Jesus, in victory. All three members of the Trinity are at work in this mighty act of redemption. But notice the logic of verse 11. It's, it's really crucial to see this. Paul is saying, if this has happened, if this Spirit dwells in you, then He also will give life to your mortal bodies. In fact, he says the same thing multiple times, like he's double underlining this connection between these two things, the Spirit dwelling in you and your future bodily resurrection, the restoration of your bodies. What does he say? Through this Spirit, the Spirit by whom God raised Jesus, this Spirit is the one who lives in you, and therefore, He will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. It's like he, he says it over and over again. He wants us to be absolutely certain about this connection. Now, why is it that we can be sure that the presence of the Spirit in believers assures us that our bodies, our mortal bodies, will receive life? Well, firstly, because we're talking about the Creator. The Father is the Creator of the physical world. He is the one who made this world and everything in it. This physical world, including our bodies. The one who said in Genesis 1, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. This God, it is the Spirit of this God. See, Genesis 1 speaks of the goodness of the body, the goodness of every work of this Creator God. 
and it's this God who has taken over and is dealing with you now, and so you can know that He has the power to do it. If He created all things in the beginning, of course He has the power to give new life to our mortal bodies. But secondly, this Spirit, the Spirit of God, is the one who gave life in the beginning, because it was through this Spirit that God brought life and form and filled the creation in the very beginning. It is this Spirit who hovered over the waters in Genesis 1, who created and ordered the cosmos, who who rearranged matter and, and caused it to flourish according to God's wisdom. And so this Spirit who is present at creation is the right one for the job. He's the one that God sent in the beginning, the giver of life, and He sends this Spirit again to renew us. He is the Creator, His Spirit is the giver of life, but third, this Spirit has raised Jesus from the dead, He says in verse 11. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, He's talking about Easter Sunday and those events, and that tomb, which was discovered empty, and that Jesus, who bodily appeared to His disciples. God has demonstrated that He has not given up on the body. It's happened at least once already, Paul is saying. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. God has demonstrated that He has a plan to raise humanity from death. Jesus is the second Adam, He is the beginning of a new humanity, He is the beginning of a new race, and God has predestined from before time that He would bring many to be conformed to this image. What does that mean? That God will bring many, so that Jesus is not alone, but the first among many brothers and sisters. Many people who are redeemed, brought in His wake into the eternal kingdom. And so, the, it's the Creator who sends His Spirit, who has raised Jesus, but fourthly, this Spirit is the Spirit who now dwells in you. And why? For this same reason. Paul is wanting to draw the connection between the Spirit raising Jesus and the Spirit who dwells in you, to give you absolute certainty that that is exactly why He has sent His Spirit into your life. The same reason that the Spirit raised Jesus to bring redemption to to its completion in the resurrection of the body is the reason that God has sent His Spirit to dwell within believers. See, the Spirit's work in Jesus was not complete until He was raised to life and seated at the right hand of the Father. And so it is with us. The Spirit's work in you is not done until He gives life to our mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Do you see that this is the end goal of our salvation, the renewal of the whole person, body and soul. In fact, Paul later in in chapter 8 will go as far as to say that this future reality is our adoption as sons. Now, isn't that curious? We're we're very familiar with the, the idea that Christians are now sons and daughters, we've been adopted we've been justified, and therefore we are declared sons. And yet Paul can speak of the future resurrection of believers, the redemption of our bodies, as our adoption. Why is that? Because here is the fullness of our inheritance. Here is the fullness of our salvation. Have a look, if you've got Romans 8 open, verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Here, 
is the fullness of our salvation, body and soul. Now, friends, it's much more than simply an individual hope, and we will rejoice in what this means for an end to our suffering. But far greater than that is God's great purpose to crown the creation with humanity, male and female, created in God's image, as the pinnacle, the height of his dis- the display of His glory within the creation. And why does God send His Son to be incarnate of the Virgin Mary, to take on our flesh and to rise to new life? Why else than to retrieve what the the evil one had stolen? The Creator would not allow it finally to be destroyed. And for His honour, He sent His Son to take on human flesh and to raise it again. A new humanity created to display the glory of God to the heavenly powers. This is the glory of God displayed, the resurrection of the body. And friends, uh, do you think of the Holy Spirit this way? If you are a a Christian believer here this morning, is this how you think about the the Spirit and why He dwells within you? Does this form part of the shape of your Christian hope? How would you finish this sentence? I have the Holy Spirit, therefore, dot, dot, dot. Christians, I think, would give a range of answers to that question. I have the Holy Spirit, therefore, uh, I'm joyful and I, and I clap more often than, than other people in church, perhaps. I, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> praise God for those who do. I think it is evidence of this, the Spirit, and perhaps we need a little more of it. But how would you finish that sentence? I have the Holy Spirit, Therefore, well, even better would be, uh, you know, we're, we're empowered by the Spirit to serve one another, perhaps. Even deeper than that, the Spirit of holiness is at work transforming us, bringing about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. But I want to suggest, and from Romans 8, and, and perhaps even more glorious, I have the Holy Spirit. Therefore, He will give life to my mortal body. My future is the resurrection. The Apostles' Creed, third section, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And what comes underneath that? The resurrection of the body. There's a reason that it follows on from the giving of the Spirit to the church, this conviction that the Spirit is working in us till that day when He raises us new. A crucial part of the hope of Easter Sunday is this hope. He will give life to my mortal body. Let's go back to that illustration that I, that I brought up earlier, the, the old stately home that had been torn apart by years of neglect What if it turned out that those new tenants who had moved in were actually the architect and the builder of that very house? The ones who originally conceived of that house, designed it, laid every brick, cut every piece of timber to to size, painstakingly put it it together and, and decorated it. Those new tenants, after years, saw it for sale and moved in with the intention, what, just of living in it like it is? Absolutely not. Because what, what are they going to do with that house? They will renovate that house. They will get to work. They will restore its beauty, even beyond what they originally designed. And they will work on it so thoroughly that it almost won't be recognizable, that those walking past will be like, well, where where did that place come from? See, the Spirit is at work from the inside out in you. If the Lord Jesus has claimed you as His own. I want you to to think right now about your, your body. It's a 
slightly unusual thing to do, perhaps, in church, but grab hold of it if you need to. This, this body that you live in, the Bible speaks very positively about your body. A human being is a body. We don't have a body, we are a body. We can't, we are not complete without it. God created it and He made us with one. This body, right now, that I feel pressing against the, the chair, this, this body which defines the limits of where I am. This body, perhaps for you, which now feel tired and weary. This body which experiences pain. And is perhaps for you a constant reminder of the effects of sin and the grave. This body which feels the pull of sin. This body, yes, this body, Jesus has claimed it. And it matters to Him. And the Spirit that dwells within this body means that it has a future. And friends, nothing can stop Him in His plans for you. None of those things, the weariness of the body, the pain that you experience perhaps, the pull of temptation even. In fact, friends, so completely does your body belong to the Lord Jesus if you are in Him, so completely that not even death will stop Him. Even if this body returns to the dust of death, the Spirit has claimed this body and will raise it. John Chrysostom says this, his sermon on, on the, this uh, passage. Now, be not thou afraid, because thou art encompassed about with a dead body. Let it have the spirit, and it sure, uh, assuredly shall rise again. Does the body matter? Yes. The body matters, and it's only after Paul has outlined this great hope that he adds the, those powerful words, urging Christians to therefore put to death the sinful deeds of the body. Why is it? Why is it that Christians are urged to live a life in the body of holiness and of service to the Lord Jesus? Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because if Christ, through the Spirit, has claimed you, body and soul, then your body belongs to Him. As we sung earlier from the Heidelberg Catechism, I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. Friends, it really matters what you do with your body. And Easter hope means waking each day. As Jesus awoke early that first Sunday morning, knowing for certain that I belong body and soul to my Saviour, Jesus Christ. Aware that I belong to Him, that I have a future, a, a, a future that is bodily restored in His eternal kingdom. Friends, that is central to, to the Easter hope. Let us celebrate it as we gather bodily week to week as a taste of that future day. Let's pray. Let's celebrate. Heavenly Father, We praise You that Christ is risen, that You have exalted Him to the highest place, given Him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that He is Lord. And Father, we rejoice this morning particularly that as part of His victory, He will raise us 
that He will restore these failing bodies so that we will be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control. Father, may You have the glory and may You have the glory now as we live in, in these bodies, as we serve You, as we live for You, as we offer ourselves and, and every part of us to you in service. Please, Father, through your Spirit, claim us more and more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.